I want to speak on the topic. Uh, you've remembered, by the way, that uh, I said a few weeks ago that I was starting a series in John, and it's going to go on for at least a year or more, um, and that I was asking you also to, uh, as you go along with us week by week, that you meditate in the Gospel of John yourself and get a journal, write down things that God might be saying to you that you might be hearing or picking up on. And as we go through the next 12 to 18 months doing this, we'll have some Sundays where you won't get a preach, but we're all going to have a say. And, and we'll get our journals and we'll get our notes and we'll compare notes and see what the Lord has been saying to us. Amen. Amen. I don't know about you, but I'm excited about that. But this morning, we're going to continue in John. And the title of the message is, What Does God See in You? What Does God See in You? John chapter 1, verses 40 to 42 One of the two disciples who heard John's words and began to follow Jesus was a man named Andrew. He went and found his brother, Simon, and told him, we have found the anointed one, which is translated the Christ. Then Andrew brought Simon to meet him. When Jesus gazed upon Andrew's brother, he prophesied to him, you are Simon, and your father's name is John, but from now on, you will be called Kephas, which means Peter the Rock. So as we continue this morning in the, in the Gospel of John, I want to look at the call of Peter and ask this question, what did God see in him and what does God see in us? But before we do that, I want us to consider just for a moment the one who witnessed to Peter, his brother Andrew. You see, for every man or woman who has done mighty things for God and whose name we know, there is an unnamed or little-known hero who first spoke to them of Jesus. Have you ever heard of a man by the name of Edward Kimball? Might have. Edward Kimball. In 1854, Kimball was a Sunday school teacher in Detroit. One day, he went to visit a 17-year-old boy who was in his Sunday school class who had little interest in God or religion. During his visit with this young man at his job in a shoe shop, he led the boy into a relationship with Christ. That young boy was D.L. Moody, who went on to become one of the greatest evangelists in the world, sharing the gospel with a hundred million people in his lifetime, as well as founding the Moody Bible Institute and the Moody Church in Chicago. But the story doesn't end there. Through his ministry, through Moody's ministry, he was responsible for a London pastor named F.B. Mayer coming to faith. Mayer, in turn, was responsible for somebody called J. Wilbur Chapman coming to faith. And Chapman influenced a man by the name of Billy Sunday back in America and led him to the Lord. And Billy Sunday went on to lead a million people to the Lord in his evangelistic meetings. 
But it doesn't stop there. Billy Sunday was integral in a man named Mordecai Ham. Great name. Mordecai Ham coming to faith. And Mordecai Ham was the preacher responsible for leading a young man to the Lord by the name of Billy Graham. <laughs> You've heard of him. <laughs> sure you have. The point, my friend, is this. Never underestimate the value or the impact of what God asks you to do. Never underestimate the value or the impact. The tract you might hand out to someone. The friend you might invite to church. The person you stop and speak to in the street and help. Who knows the long-term impact of the seed that you plant? For every Paul, there was an Ananias. For every Peter, there was an Andrew. Little is known of Andrew. He's only mentioned about 12 times in the New Testament, and four of those times, his name is just in a list. But his brother, whom he brought to Jesus, went on to become the chief apostle, one of Jesus' closest companions, and one of the most influential leaders in the history of the church. So never underestimate the power, the impact, the value of the thing that God asks you to do, no matter how little it is. So let's take a, a closer look. I want us to take a closer look this morning at how Peter met Jesus. And the first thing we've already touched on in some ways, it's this. The scripture says, Andrew went and found his brother. As Alan Clark was saying, Alan Clark was great, wasn't he, last week? Real, real encouragement, uh, Alan. As, as Alan was saying last week about if the gospel is real, it needs to be real when we're at home with our families. Those closest to us always know about the reality of our faith. They know more about the reality of our faith than the strangers we speak to in the street. Talking to strangers about Jesus is easy. They don't know who you are. They don't know if this thing is real in your life. But your family knows. Your family knows. And it's natural to want to tell your family when you come to the Lord, when you discover the anointed one. But it's not easy. Does anyone witness with that? Never easy, is it? To tell your family. When I came to the Lord in Zimbabwe in 1980, I was born here, just down the road in the Whittington, and I grew up in the East End. But when, uh, when I was, uh, started my career, uh, a few years after, after starting as a journalist, I ended up in Zimbabwe, uh, writing about Zimbabwe's independence. And so I came to the Lord in Zimbabwe in 1980, and I desperately wanted to tell my parents back in England what had happened but I was worried about how they would react. I was worried about how they would react. So I recorded a two-hour cassette. Okay, this is the first known podcast, okay? I record, because there was so much to write, I decided to speak, I had a little cassette recorder, and I got a two-hour cassette. Do you remember those old things? The C-120s, they were called. <laughs> <laughs> That's taking you back, isn't it? Young ones don't even know what a cassette is. It's a little plastic thing about that big, all right? <laughs> it's got tape in it. <laughs> I recorded a two-hour cassette telling them about my, my mum and dad, about my first Christmas in Africa, how strange it was, how we celebrated Christmas in blazing hot sunshine and jumping into a swimming pool to cool off, and how people in Africa would send Christmas cards to one another with pictures of people skating <laughs> on frozen lakes and snow-capped trees 
And I'm looking at this Chris and I'm thinking, <laughs> how did this happen? <laughs> and in the middle of this two hour podcast, let's get that out of the way. In the middle of this two hour podcast, I dropped one sentence, one little clue as to what had happened to me. I, I said very quickly, in passing, and oh yes, I went to a prayer meeting on New Year's Eve. And uh, last week, we <laughs> by return of post came a letter from my mum and dad. Opening sentence. What is this prayer meeting that you went to? <laughs> what is that all about? You know, a Andrew... <laughs> Andrew said only one sentence to Peter, found the Messiah. You know, in the Greek, it's three words. That's all he said to, to Peter, his brother. He said, found the Messiah. <laughs> in Greek, that's what it is. <laughs> found the Messiah. <laughs> I, on the other hand, proceeded to Bible bash my poor parents until they were on the ropes and calling for oxygen. <laughs> I sent them over the, the following months a series of letters. Each letter was 10 to 12 A4 pages typed edge to edge, giving them the gospel, <laughs> assailing them with the scriptures. At one point, my friend, a colleague of mine from the Cambridge Evening News before I went out to Zimbabwe, he was coming out to visit me in Bulawayo. And before he could come, my mum and dad got hold of him and said, begged him, said, John, please, when you go there, try and rescue Brendan. <laughs> they didn't know I'd been rescued already. <laughs> try and rescue me. That's what they asked him. Undeterred, I continued with the Bible bashing. I returned to England in September 1981 for their silver wedding anniversary. I promised I would come for my mum and dad's silver wedding anniversary, September 81. And I brought them a gift. Would you like to guess? A Bible. Oh, stop there. Not just a Bible, this Bible. <laughs> this is the Bible I brought my mum and dad 40 years ago. I had it with me. This weighs about, f about three or four kilos at least. I brought it in my hand baggage on the plane. <laughs> and I presented it to my mum and dad. Biggest Bible I could find. It's actually quite, it is King James. It's got center column reference. It's got whole sections of beautiful color, color prints of famous paintings of biblical scenes and, and all, manner of, all manner of things. So I presented this, came and presented this. And I thought, at least it's big enough that I can, if they won't listen, I can just bash them with it anyway. <laughs> Now, <laughs> needless to say, my mum and dad rejected it. They didn't want it. Don't worry, it's still here, as you can see. <laughs> and it's been in their house all those, all those years. The, um, they didn't want it. And my mum said a strange thing to me. She said, is it a Catholic Bible? And I, I knew, in our family, we'd never had a Bible under our roof as long as I lived. We'd never seen a Bible. We'd never held a Bible, let alone know that there was such a thing as a Catholic Bible. It dawned on me later that my mum, in preparation for me coming back to England, had been talking to people <laughs> and trying to get genned up on what was going on. <laughs> but anyway, they, they rejected it. And so I thought, well, it may be natural to want to tell your family the good news about Jesus, but there has to be a better way <laughs> of doing it than hitting them over the head with a 4KG King James family Bible. <laughs> the, the Apostle Andrew patented method of telling your family was a much better way to go. Scripture says, Andrew brought Simon to meet him. Andrew brought Simon to meet him. Just as John the Baptist had pointed Andrew and John to Jesus, 
So now Andrew points his brother to Jesus. He brings Simon to meet Jesus and leaves the job of convincing and conversion to God. Leave that to Jesus. You know, while I was here in that September 81 in England during that month, I borrowed my dad's car one morning so I could visit this church. That's 40 years ago. The Gospel Center. And amazingly, that morning, my mum decided to come with me. She said, I'm coming. I don't know if she was coming to try and check out what was going, <laughs> what was going on, but she said, I'm coming. I can't remember anyone who was here that day. Back there, you're talking 40 years ago, and that was the first time I visited the gospel center. I can't remember anyone. It was dark and dingy in here. Those of you who go back, remember, we had a, a much smaller platform that had red carpet. The floor was a, a dark parquet wooden flooring. We had gray plastic chairs. Um, this, this whole wall was dark wooden panels. This whole wall was dark wooden panels. That bit there was blocked off, and that was the creche, and that was bricked, bricked off, a separate room. There was no foyer, and those doors weren't there. Where Ian is sitting, there were two sets of dark, deep, brown, heavy doors that you had to fight your way through to get in. And even if you got through them, it was very unlikely you would get through without Sid collaring you. So, <laughs> so we came in and we sat, my mum and I, we sat roughly where, where you are, uh, uh, Kathy. Uh, I remember we, we sat back there. I can't remember who was preaching. I do remember this, that we simply sang from the Redemption Hymnal. No choruses, it was just the redemption hymnal that we were singing from. No, no, no uh, projectors and all that newfangled stuff. <laughs> I think we had one key keyboard, there was one keyboardist, it must have been, must have been Shirley, I think, uh, Wendy, who was playing the keyboard at the back somewhere. Or, oh no, it was strange, and they had these two or three of these little tannoy speakers and uh, I don't know who it was he who was preaching. I can't remember a single word. <laughs> but from the moment we came in and we sat there, my mum sobbed. And she cried and cried. And you know what it's like when you're crying and you're embarrassed about it? My mum, my mum's funny like that. My mum used to cry every time she watched the film Inner the Sixth Happiness. You know, with, the, with those kids, those, those orphans coming over the hill right at the end singing This Old Man. And we as kids would look at mum because we knew she would cry at that point. <laughs> and she'd go, don't look at me! <laughs> My mum would be crying. My mum, and she was so embarrassed. Didn't, couldn't speak to me. I said, mum, what's up? I was being naughty, really. I knew what was up. <laughs> she said, don't talk to me. And the tears were streaming down her face all the way through, through the hymns, through the preaching, everything. As we were driving home, my mum, frustrated at crying and not understanding why, uh, I said to her, she said, why? Why was that happening? I said, mum, it was because the Holy Spirit was working in me. And speaking to you. I said, Mum, you met Jesus. You met Jesus. A couple of months later, when I was back in Africa and preparing to go to Bible college, I got a letter one morning when I opened it and I read it. My mum had written there, Son, please pray for your father and I. We're going to give our hearts to Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> After all the novella-length letters and heavy-duty Bible bashing had failed, <laughs> the simple encounter with Jesus in the presence of God, the simple encounter, Jesus. You wouldn't have thought it, would you? Come into this dingy place. 
and singing. <laughs> and my mum met Jesus. That's what it took to convince her. That's what it took with Peter, Andrew's brother. Andrew obviously knew his brother. He said, found the Messiah, come meet him. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> That'll be e the easiest way. And it leads me on to the, to the third thing this morning that I want to say. The scripture says, when Jesus gazed upon Andrew's brother, he prophesied to him. It's from the Passion Translation. When Jesus gazed upon Andrew's brother, he prophesied to him. He beheld him. He didn't just look at him, he perceived him. He beheld him. He considered him. And here's the incredible thing. Jesus didn't just see what Peter was, which was a rough and ready fisherman. He saw what he would be. He didn't just see what Peter had been. He saw what he would become through the presence of God in his life. And he spoke and he prophesied that destiny over him. He said, you are Simon, but you will be Kephas, which is the rock. If we're asking the question, my friends, this morning, what does God see in us? What does God see in me? This is the answer. He sees not what you were, but what you will be. And he begins to speak, to prophesy that destiny, that new reality over you. He begins to speak his word over you. We, we've seen it in, in scripture, throughout scripture, Song of Songs, throughout that amazing song of love, the bridegroom, have you ever noticed the bridegroom only ever speaks, prophesies words of finished beauty over his bride. Never condemns her. Never points out her faults and her flaws and, her, and bashes her. <laughs> Just keeps telling her how beautiful you are. And when she raises problems and, and has got a problem of low self-esteem and, and a problem of, of little foxes and this and that, the bridegroom just says, don't worry, we'll sort it together. Come. We'll sort it. In John 3.17, we know John 3.16 so well. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Do you know the next verse is just as good. The next verse is just as good. Verse 17 of John 3 says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that through him the world might be saved. Instead of condemning us for our past, Jesus prophesies our future as we join ourselves to him. And he begins to speak to you what he sees in you. What he sees you becoming in him. He begins to speak that to you. And it's something we've seen in the Bible. When God, uh, so many times, when God looked at Abram, he didn't see a liar who had put his own wife at risk of adultery and rape through his lies that's the truth about what Abraham did. He put his own wife, Sarah, at risk of adultery and rape by telling a lie that she was his sister. But God didn't see that when he looked at Abram. He saw what he would become with the presence of God in his life. You will no longer be called Abram, father of a nation, but your name will be Abraham, father of many nations, Genesis 17. To Abram and Sarah, a childless couple, 
God spoke the destiny of descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky. (laughs) When God looked at Jacob, he didn't see a con artist who had lied to his father and cheated his brother out of his inheritance. He saw the prince and the ruler that he would become with God in his life. And he changed his name. Genesis 32 said, you will no longer be called Jacob, which means deceiver, but you will be called Israel, one who rules with God. In other words, with God joined to your life, you become a ruler and a prince. When God looked at Saul of Tarsus, he didn't see a murderer who had been complicit in making the first martyr of the Christian church. He saw one who would become one of his greatest witnesses. And he intersected him on the Damascus Road and prophesied that destiny over him. You are my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and the people of Israel. And Paul would say later on, me, chief of all sins, <laughs> he didn't come and berate me. He didn't come and tell me off. He didn't come and drag me through the mud for what I had done. He came and said, this is what you'll be. This is what I'm going to do in your life. This is the impact and the difference I will make. My friends, when you encounter Jesus, he begins to speak and prophesy his word of life over you. The plans he has for you. The plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future, Jeremiah 29 and verse 11. And as you continue to meet with Jesus, he continues to speak his destiny over you, never condemning you, always encouraging you, breathing his life into you. John 6 and verse 63, Jesus said, the words I speak to you are spirit and life. He was saying, I'm speaking life to you. I'm speaking what you will be in me. 2 Timothy 3 verse 16 from the Passion Translation says this, God has transmitted his very substance into every scripture for it is God breathed and it will empower you by its instruction and correction, giving you strength to take the right direction and lead you deeper into the path of godliness. So God has invested his life in his word. It is his breath. And he speaks when he sees you, when he sees me, he speaks his word of life. Not seeing the past, but seeing my future, your future, what I've become, what you become in him. What does God see in you? What does he see when he looks at you? I know what he doesn't see. He doesn't see all your past faults and failures, and frustrations. But he sees what you will be. He sees what you will become. I know when he gazed at me, he didn't see a man who had lied and cheated and stolen and blasphemed. But he saw what I would become with him in my life. Just as he took Peter from being a fisherman and made him a fisher of men, so he took me from being a reporter and made me a teller of good news. (laughs) What amazing love is this, that when he gazes upon you, he's not put off by your past, 
but he forgives and restores and washes you in his words of love and grace and prophesies a different destiny, a finished beauty over you. A destiny you never thought possible. A beauty made possible by his sacrifice, by his love, by his presence. Shall we pray? Father, thank you. When you looked at me, Lord, you didn't see what I was and what I had been, but you saw what you would make me. And you spoke your words of life over me. And I thank you, Lord, you've done that for every one of us here. Thank you, Father. While we're bowed in prayer, I want to ask this question, if there is anyone here and you've not yet allowed the Lord to speak that life over you, you've not repented, you've not turned, you've not come to him and said, please forgive me. Perhaps you've been scared that if you came, he would see what you had been. Perhaps you've had the thought in your heart, how could God ever love one like me after all that I have done? But my friends, I'm saying to you in his name today, he looks at you and he sees not what you have been, but what you will be. And if you have not yet opened your heart to such amazing love I want to give you the opportunity to do that right now this morning if you would like to answer and say uh, yes okay I want to meet Jesus would you please put your hand up and then put it down again and then I know to pray for you if there's anyone like that here today you want to bring yourself to Jesus is there anyone see that hand yeah. I also want to ask if there are any and you have been weighed down and held back because the thought that the enemy so often puts into your mind when you try to come to Jesus the thought comes what will he see in me after the things I've done and the things I've been places I've been and what I've done but this morning Jesus wants to set you free from that thinking and he wants you to know that he looks upon you seeing what his heart and love will make you if you let him So if there's anyone who has just felt that burden of guilt from the past and you've wondered and asked the question, what does God see when he looks at me? And today I believe the word of God is setting you free. And if you would like to be included in that prayer, then please stand now. And I'm going to pray for those who just want to be set free from that negative image. Who have felt, thank you, I see that hand. Please just stand to your feet and that person's hand. Yes, thank you. Those of you putting your hands up, please stand. I'm going to pray for you from here and then I'm going to ask that you come. If anyone else wants to be included in this prayer, I'm praying for you to be set free from the negativity of what you were in the past you thought that God still sees you as you were but today the love of God in Christ Jesus is saying to you he sees you as you 
are now in him and will be in him. Then please stand for prayer and I'm going to include you in this prayer. Father, you see the ones standing and I ask very simply, I bring them to you, Lord. <laughs> uh, just like Andrew brought his brother, Peter. Lord, these ones who are standing, I'm bringing them to you right now. And Lord, I'm asking Jesus, would you speak your word of life into them? Jesus, would you speak your word of life into their hearts? Would you tell them, Lord, of the beauty that you see in them because you are working in their lives and you are transforming them and changing them. Jesus, would you let them hear your word and your voice in their very heart telling them you were called but now you are. <laughs> and I pray, Father, for everyone who has been beset by guilt from the past and hangovers from the past, that right now, Jesus, your words of love would set them free. That they would be free in Jesus' name. They would be free in Jesus' name. Free to become everything you've called them to be. Everything you've planned for them. Lord, let the words sink into their hearts that you know the plans you have for them. Plans to prosper them, to bless them, to give them hope and future. Father, thank you. Father, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. those who stood for prayer if you want to come up there will be members of the prayer ministry team who'd be happy to talk with you and tell you more about how you can meet Jesus or about how Jesus can set you free but right now let's stand and say the grace and without leaving our seats but can we just say the grace to one another today can we speak it to one another and just say to one another in his name and prophesy this over one another. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and evermore. Amen. 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 Anyone who wants to come and have a look at this and feel sorry for my parents as I bash them with it, you're welcome. I'll leave it up at the front. <laughs>